Welcome to the latest webinar and the uh, Palisade series of uh, webinars. Uh, we're gonna be starting momentarily. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Our um, episode today is going to be a uh, slightly shorter talk than we had done in the previous episodes. Um, in this um, edition, or this uh, episode, we're going to uh, have Dave Cousins, uh, one of the Palisade co-founders and project leads, uh, focus give a focus talk on sharing FHA encrypted data and FHA keys using serialization in the Palisade library. Um, this is very much an, an engineering how-to oriented uh, uh, focus. Uh, the goal of the webinar is to introduce how secure privacy protected collaboration is enabled using lattice encryption primitives such as PKE, PRE, and, and FHE and Palisade. And um, as you know, the expected audience is anyone interested in lattice-based crypto, uh, homomorphic encryption, and uh, applications, uh, particularly focused on developers, engineers, and uh, researchers and students. Um, by way of introduction, uh, Dave had spent many years in support of uh, DARPA and the DoD uh, particularly a lot of the early DARPA efforts associated with homomorphic encryption, um, such as Proceed and Safeware, and has been one of the driving forces behind the Palisade, web, uh, Palisade Open Source Library. Uh, he is currently the uh, Director of Duality Labs, the externally funded R&D wing of uh, Duality Technologies, which is um, a continuing improvement and application of Palisade. So without further ado, uh, Dave, I'll kick it over to you, and uh, please, happy to hear your thoughts. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Dave Cousins, and I'm the director of Duality Labs. And one of the roles that I have in Duality Labs is to actually bring Palisade from a prototypical, uh, researchy oriented library to something that is actually hardened enough for people to start using in applications. One of the things that we often come across when users uh, try to use Palisade is that getting multiple heavyweight processes to communicate uh, and, and basically share or copy uh, Palisade objects between each other can be cumbersome. Um, and so the goal of this particular seminar is to kind of pull the covers off of that, show a couple of uh, examples of how serialization is used in Palisade, and also provide um, a concrete example of two heavyweight processes communicating with each other in a client-server kind of uh, situation. Uh, I want to thank Ian Kwa to uh, who has uh, worked with me as an intern this year because a lot of what you'll see is based on work that, that he did to uh, actually separate and serialize a client server application for us. Um, I extended it a bit for this, uh, for this seminar and uh, you can find the uh, source codes for all this in a, uh, in a uh, repository that's in the Palisade uh, group under GitLab. So without uh, any more ado, I will go through the slides. What I want to point out is that if at any point people have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A section and the moderator will uh, stop us at an appropriate point and we'll address them. So let us share the screen. Okay. and. Um, Hopefully we can begin. So um, bear with me while I find my uh, various screens here for uh, running the show. Um, okay, just bear with me another second. Here we go. All right. Okay, good. Okay, now we are. All set. We are flying. All right, so the agenda for this talk 
are going to be basically three related topics. Whoops. First is the role of serialization and deserialization in encrypted applications, uh, focusing primarily from the uh, C++ perspective, because Palisade is written in C++. I'm going to provide a list of basic examples that you can go into the uh, Palisade distribution and, and take a look at. And then I'm going to present a more complicated example of two cooperating Palisade processes. So the first section is the role of serialization in applications, focusing on C++. So generally in computing, serialization is the process of translating a data structure or an object into a format that can be stored or transmitted. In other words, into, a, into bytes. And then reconstructing it later, possibly on a, on a different system, possibly on a system in a different operating system. But um, our focus here will be in two programs running on the same type of operating system. And this reconstruction is known as deserialization. And what it does is produce a clone of that object. Now, to be clear, this is not a shared object where what happens in one process gets reflected in the object on the second process. What it is is really a copy or clone of that object. So fundamentally, in Palisade, these objects are data structures that are used to contain the information that describes the scheme and environment that the user has set up in order to perform encrypted operations. So applications of serialization include the following. There's messaging, which is transferring data between programs on the same or different computers. Uh, storage, which is a saving and recalling of data in databases or files. And then there's other computing models that are enabled, such as remote procedure calls, for example, SOAP, uh, distributed objects as components, uh, such as COM and CORBA. These are, these are techniques where objects are indeed distributed throughout uh, a large uh, set of programs. We're not going to be talking about those at all. What we're going to be doing is focusing on messaging and storage. It's an essential tool for building real world systems that use Palisade. Um, it's all well and good to write one program that shows data being encrypted, being manipulated, but to actually get some work out of it, you know, encryption is usually something where we, we uh, have one person on one end, another person on the other end, and they want to either share data or they want to work on this data and compute and compute on it with with certain security uh, promises. So serialization in C++ is not easy. Um, C++ has no standard serialization library. And the serialization and deserialization of complicated objects that use pointers is not a simple task. These objects can be made up of other objects and other data structures, and that data can be distributed throughout non-contiguous memory. Um, pointer references are not portable. In other words, uh, the pointer reference that you use in your program, if you just copied that number and you pass it to a separate program, would point to some other arbitrary piece of memory. You can't just copy these pointer values into a file and expect that to work. You also need to gather memory blocks and re-reference these pointers when you reconstruct them. Uh, this is not easy to do. And also changes in your object code. In other words, if you change the source code for your, for your uh, objects, require changes in the code that serializes and deserializes them. And originally Palisade um, had serialization and deserialization that was basically constructed manually. And it was a terror to maintain because anytime we made a change in, in one of our objects, we would have to figure out why, you know, where, where to, to make the change in the serialization. It's a maintenance nightmare. So I, an example of a complicated data, data laid out that we have in, in uh, Palisade is, for example, a CKKS ciphertext object. Now, the ciphertext object in CKKS starts with a handful of integer members, and they are used to keep track of data dimensions, levels, multiplicative depth. And then there's a shared pointer to a vector of objects called DCRT poly. <clears throat> now, this vector is normally two, sometimes three, 
uh, in length, depending on where you are in a multiplication and a renormalization. Um, so it's a dynamically shaped uh, vector. But a DCR poly itself is a complex data structure that has a handful of, of members that keep count of dimensions and moduli, and a pointer to a vector of pointers, two vectors of int 64s, which store the rings in the tower of the uh, DCRT poly. And that vector of vectors changes dimensions as the um, ciphertext um, participates in multiplications. So, you know, this is a fairly complicated data structure. And then finally, there's a shared pointer to a metadata map, and that's a map of strings that uses keys and then generic metadata. This is really an arbitrary parameter for app application level code. And um, so you're talking about pointers to pointers to pointers. It's very complicated. Now, fortunately, there are libraries that take most of the work out of this. And in Palisade, we use a library called Serial for our serialization. It's a C++ header-only library for serialization. Um, and um, it supports STL objects and shared pointers and unique pointers. And it serializes to both JSON and binary. And JSON is a human-readable format. It is a lightweight version of XML. Um, and it's very popular uh, with Java. It's, um, it's very useful for small objects because uh, you can actually write it yourself if you had to. But it is very difficult to scale up to large objects. And um, it also is, it also being ASCII with lots of uh, um, other commas and parentheses and things around it. Um, it also gets to be fairly large. Now, binary is the smallest size. Um, the, the downside is binary um, is stored with a certain type of endianness um, implied. And you know, if you move from one a computer with one type of processor to a computer with another, you may find that the binaries don't map properly. There may be other state steps that you have to do to swap bytes and things like that. But generally speaking, if you're running on the same type of processor, um, it's that's not an issue. Uh, the other great thing about Serial is it's easily customizable to support Palisade objects. Now, we won't cover the details of Serial, but um, in general, in Palisade, we need to add a pair of serialization and deserialization functions for complicated objects like crypto contexts and cipher texts. These functions allow Serial to actually self-inspect the code and parse these complex objects during compile time. And then it figures out through metaprogramming serialization and deserialization routines automatically. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. The penalty is that these functions take a long time to compile. And so we usually separate these functions out um, to a separate compilation module so that um, changes in your, in your system code don't necessarily have to, uh, have to trigger this kind of recompilation because it will increase the compile time quite a bit. So some basic examples from the Palisade distribution of serialization and deserialization functions. Um, we have serialization um, supported in all of our public key encryption schemes. Um, and uh, I also wanted to point out, I don't have a, a good handle on whether we have questions or not. So I just want uh, Kurt to, to uh, chime in if he sees any. Um, no, no questions so far, but I'm definitely tracking it. And if anyone does have questions, feel free to uh, send it over and happy to get it uh, front and center. All right, terrific. So um, as I said, serialization is supported in all the public key encryption schemes. Um, one way of learning how to use the serialization is to look at the functional unit tests, um, although these can be hard to read. Um, we have a serialization unit test in the core module, which basically 
has serialization and deserialization functions tested on very basic Palisade data types, such as our, our big integers and vectors of big integers. Um, and we also have unit tests specific to each of the schemes supported. Uh, they are in the source PKE unit test directory, and they begin with the same unit test serialized, and then you have the, the, the name of the scheme. These serialized and deserialized um, crypto context and other functions, but also there can be specific functions that we have had to write to serialize some very complicated objects that may, um, may be dynamically sized based on the application. Examples in our PKE examples directory are much easier to understand. Um, they are single thread programs that serialize and save a crypto context, the keys and cipher texts to disk. Then they clear out and reload them into new variables. So this is a single thread really demonstrating how one would save and load these uh, for either long-term storage or if you wanted to do checkpointing, things like that, but really one process, okay? We have three examples, one of which is for BFV RNS, one of which is for BGV RNS, and one which is for CKKS. They are very similar, but slightly different because there are different keys associated with these. Now, I'm going to give you an example of systems of cooperating processes and show the serialization and deserialization between two heavyweight processes. So passing objects between multiple heavyweight processes is complicated. A system that's composed of cooperating processes needs to pass serialized objects to each other through files or sockets or shared memory mechanisms. And it also needs mechanisms to synchronize in addition to passing the data. And these can take the form of file locks, mutexes, semaphores. Um, this is known as inter-process communication. Uh, it is a very common um, computer science topic. Um, basically, we are talking about processes that do not share the same memory map, unlike threads. So many of us are used to programming threads and uh, synchronizing between threads. The thing about threads within one process is they are, um, they are all on the same memory map, okay? And so you don't actually have to copy objects in order to use them. With heavyweight processes, in other words, processes that you actually run from the command line in Linux, um, you're not in the same memory map. Um, and you have to um, not only move the data between them, but you have to synchronize uh, between the processes because, um, for example, if one process is writing a file, another process can look for that file to exist, but unless that there's, there's um, uh, a means by which that the, the process is notified when the file is actually finished being written to, it could start reading the file while the other side is writing it, and, you know, it, it, it basically um, basically to get a part of a message. Same things happen in sockets. Sockets um, are, are streaming data and when you read from a socket you don't necessarily get all the data that is meant to be sent. So there's protocols that have to be written to guarantee that you have read all the data that you expect to read. We've built a small repository to demonstrate some sample systems and we've populated it right now with one sample system. This is the uh, address of the repository. It's in the Palisade group, and it's called Palisade Serial Examples. Uh, this is the same place that we put the uh, examples for integer processing uh, that we had in our, our last uh, uh, last seminar, and it's where we will put future uh, future examples. So. Um, the other reason we put it in a separate repo and not in the Palisade repo is because we want to use boost interprocess mechanisms. These are very easy to use C++ mechanisms that allow you to synchronize programs uh, without having to get into some complicated roll your own system. Um, but we did not want to 
put that into the Palisade uh, repository simply because not every system would support uh, all of the boost uh, processes. Most notably, there can be difficulties with uh, Windows. So let's talk about this example. And this is a client server for distributed secure computation. And this is the example that Ian Kwa uh, helped us with. So what we have here is a CKKS-based CKKS distributed encrypted computation. On one side, we'll have a server called real server. It represents a secure repository of private data. And on the other side, we'll have a, a client, which is going to process the secure data remotely, okay? What we do is we're going to transfer these objects using file IO, and we're going to synchronize this transfer with boost named mutexes. And this will prevent files from being read before the writing is completed on the other side. Um, this could have been done with sockets. Uh, it could have been done um, if, if these processes were on a large distributed memory machine. It could have been done with some form of shared memory mechanism. Um, but it's done with file I.O. And um, in C++, file I.O. and socket I.O. can be made to look very similar. So going through the flow, as time goes on from top to bottom, First, we have the server builds and serializes a crypto context. It makes its keys and serializes the public key. And then we have various computation keys. So in CKKS, you need keys for when you do multiplications and you need keys for when you do rotations. You also need keys for when you do uh, a summation over, over a vector. So these are sent to files and then um, through the named mutex, the server knows when it's okay to read these files. So it reads these files in and it builds a crypto context and keys from the deserialized files. And I'm going to go into some code details uh, in the next slides. But functionally, it then sends a data request. Now, this data request could be similar to an SQL query. query. It could be some kind of um, um, other simpler form of selecting particular data out of a, a set. But the idea is it's requesting a block of data to be processed uh, from the server. The server receives that, encrypts the requested data, serializes it, sends it back. So the client then receives this encrypted ciphertext and starts processing. For this example, we have some basic computation that's done. And one thing we want to also show is that with the public key, the client can encrypt more data, more more data that that you know for, that may have been from a different source. So this computation is done, and the results are sent back to the to the server. Now the server receives the encrypted result, and in a real world situation, the server might um, might decrypt the answer and provide it back to the client, um, because, for example, if the client is doing statistical analysis of raw data. Well, the raw data may be private, but the uh, aggregate statistics may be okay to share, okay? In this situation, what the server is gonna do is just gonna simply decrypt and verify these results because it's a, a known sequence of, of operations. So this is the code that you can uh, look at, you can examine, and you can play around with it. Um, and there are several steps that have to be done in a certain order. And this is where many of our users get into difficulty. So that's why, why we are, we're showing the detailed steps. First, let's look at how the server sends the crypto context and keys, okay? Now for flexibility, sending a crypto, serializing a crypto context and sending it does not share everything within that context. For example, keys. Keys can be quite large. Um, the server has to serialize specific multiple components, and then the client has to deserialize those. The client can also regenerate some of them if necessary, but in general, you know, deserializing them is, is fine. Most objects can be serialized directly with a function called serialize to file. That is a generic function. Uh, that's one of the nice things about serial. 
Um, the program server program has a function called write data, which serializes these following components using these functions. The crypto context and the public key are serialized with this serialize to file function. However, the eval multiplication key and the, relinear, the eval multiplication slash relinearization key is, is somewhat complicated and that has its own function that uh, is a, a method in the crypto context itself called serialize eval mult key. Similarly, the uh, rotation key is serialized with an eval automorphism key call. Let me talk about uh, sending these keys. Um, the, the eval mult and rotation keys are handled in special functions because there are several objects uh, of each type associated with, with these in the context. There's multiple rotation keys, okay? There is in fact a rotation key for each, there's a rotation key for each index of rotation used by the application. And those can get quite large in some applications. Um, these functions serialize directly to, to standard O stream. And so the user needs to open and close an OF stream in the code to actually save them to file. Um, eval sum key is a key that's used for summation over the elements of an encrypted vector. And it's not used in this example, but it may be required in your example. Um, on the client end, receiving and reconstructing these keys are detailed in a function called receive CC and keys in the real client app. There are several steps needed in addition to transferring the objects, and this is where a lot of people get tripped up. So the first thing is that we have to clear out any Palisade data objects when we deserialize and reassemble a client crypto context. And so two lines are used, one called release all contexts, which is used before creating a new crypto context. And then loading our crypto, uh, client crypto context um, is done with a straight deserialize from file. After that, we have to clear keys because there may be some default key structures that are, uh, are, are generated when we uh, are, uh, generate our crypto context. Normally, when you make a crypto context using its constructor, all of these things are taken, taken care of. However, we're sort of creating a crypto context from portions. And in, in, in doing so, it's, uh, it's necessary to just go through these extra steps to make sure that everything is initialized properly. So clear out the eval mult keys and the um, rotation automorphism keys, and then we load the keys. And the, the public key can be loaded generically with a deserialize from file. Um, the eval mult key and the rotation keys have their own functions, deserialized functions, uh, which reassemble um, the, the structure that holds the keys. And then the eval sum key would also need to be loaded if it was used. Once all this is set up, sending and receiving ciphertext is actually very straightforward. Uh, it's done with a serialized to file and a deserialized from file. Um, now, this is where we could use uh, serialize, deserialize as well to give us more flexibility. Um, you know, serialize to and from file um, is uh, sort of implies a file name. If we were to serialize and deserialize directly, uh, then you go to an O stream object. And an O stream object is a very flexible object because you could use a file stream, uh, which inherits that you can go to local memory using string stream. You can go to a socket using boost socket stream, and you can go to shared memory using the boost into process shared memory. Okay, um, so so this is where one can build much more complicated systems. Okay, um, I thought it best to talk a little bit about the object sizes, and I do notice that we have one QA came, uh, question came up. Should we look yeah. at? Yeah, before we get too far along, there was a question, Dave, about one thing on slide 12. Um, I'll just read off the question. I thank you for, for submitting the question. Um, a question regarding the process explained on page 12. Is that a real client 
CPP file within the Palisade release folder with a working example, or was that just an example of the process? So if we go back to page 12, me while I look just to see where we are. Okay, this is a real example. Um, I will say first of all, this is in this is in the um, this is in the uh, oops the example. I'm sorry. This is in the example here. Palisade serial examples. So if you go to this URL, there is a there is a repo there, and like our other examples, you you need to have an installed Palisade on your system, and then this will build and use the install Palisade library to uh, to complete the build. But this is this is working code, and you'll see an output in it shortly. There is a similar example inside our Palisade repository that does not use boost for controlling the process communication. It uses file locks. It is a little bit more complicated. It is an earlier version. Um, and I decided that it would be best to give you a somewhat more streamlined version that focuses more on the serialization and deserialization and then the complexities due to the fact that um, we're building locks from files and whatnot. But it, it's doing pretty much the same thing. And that's in um, that's in the PKE examples repository in a subdirectory. And I believe it's called uh, real server. OK, so to answer your question, there's two copies or two different versions, but this is the one that I would recommend going to. OK. So I'm going to um, move forward with our slides here, not knowing any other way of doing it than rolling through. Okay, so we were talking about object sizes and FHE objects can be large. In this example, which um, is not a very, by the way, not a very deep um, multiplicative depth, all right, because we are just doing some fairly simple examples here. Um, we have uh, the following sizes for the files uh, we have in our crypto context is very small. All right, it's always very small. Uh, but as typical ciphertext um, in binary, it's uh, in binary uh, storage format, which is um, the, the one that we use in the example. Um, it's 5.6 megabytes per, per ciphertext. If we were to use JSON, and the way you would do that is you would go to both the client and server and simply globally replace, you know, binary with JSON whenever it, um, whenever, whenever there's a serialization function, um, it blows up to 44 megabytes. Okay. Uh, public key is the same size as the ciphertext. Um, and what gets very large are the eval mult, mult keys at 23 megabytes and 226 megabytes. And then the rotation keys, uh, if you have a lot of rotation, can be very large. Uh, as you can see here, the, the file for the rotation keys is, is 91 megabytes and the uh, JSON is, is topping off at a gigabyte. And um, the moral of that story, by the way, the size is related to security requirements. When you specify what uh, standard uh, you want to use uh, for that scheme, well, whether it's 128-bit uh, or, or whatever, and also the multiplicative depth that you desire. Um, um, thing is, basically, only use JSON when you must, right? Like if you're doing human-oriented debugging and you need to look at the, the output of the files, there are some protocols which um, which require JSON, and you know if that's if that's necessarily, but it is at a, a significant cost of size. And then, of course, you know if you were to transmit these, it's a significant cost of network bandwidth. So to run the example code, um, we are getting to the end. Um, first, you have to clone, build, and install a Palisade from the development repo. Um, we are in the process of putting together a Docker um, image uh, for our various uh, releases. Uh, so one would be able to use a Docker image instead of having to clone, build, and install. Um, but then you clone the Palisade serial examples repo, 
and there are built detailed build instructions there. Um, it is a fairly simple uh, CMake process for this example. And um, you then basically open two windows and um, go to your build directory and you run the server in, in one window and you run the client in the other window. And so it's as simple as running the server. What will happen is it will go through, it will acquire locks. Um, if it needs to wait for the for the client, you'll see that it's it, it'll it'll say it's it's waiting for a lock to be to be um, generated. We have two locks in this example, um, which is kind of a built and suspender situation. One really only needs one lock to coordinate two processes like this, but everybody each side has their own lock, and and basically they grab the lock when they're writing files, and when the last file for a sequence of transfers is written, they release the lock. The other side waits for the lock. For example, here you can see it's it's creating and acquiring a client lock and then going to acquire a server lock. There's a certain pause in here. It's basically going into a sleep loop and then it acquires the server lock. And so one side generates data, the other side processes data, receives the data, and then shows us that yes, all of these processes that we, we did um, give the correct answer and then everything cleans up. That's very typical um, type of type of client server activity for a simple uh, situation. When you build actual servers, um, it gets more complicated. It's an entire um, class in itself about how one builds um, socket based uh, clients and servers because frankly things go asynchronously and you have to use some different programming paradigms. This is what I would call a set of sequential cooperating processes that are waiting for each other to do things back and forth. Um, I think we have another question. Or is that the same question? Yes, Dave. Um, so the question from uh, Amadeo is, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, a question on slide 17. Uh, keys and crypto material looks big for FHE. Which security level of depth are provided by such values? Hmm, okay. Um, yep. Yes. All right. I will um, have to say I cannot remember what security levels uh, were used. I do believe that the multiplicative of depth is fairly small. All right. Um, the code is there and we can look at it. Um, it, it is um, most likely. Uh, at least 128 bits, if not um, one of the larger values. Um, so, so you can look in the source codes for the exact answer. One what, what, one thing I'll add is that uh, do, you know Palisade, as a community and, and Duality in particular, uh, we do focus on and are members of the Homework for Encryption.org industry consortium for setting security standards for Homework for Encryption, fully Homework for Encryption. And as a general rule, we do conform to the security, the concrete parameter settings for security, which is generally at the level of at least 128 bit security. And my understanding, Dave, is that that is what you're actually conforming to here is the 128 bit security, which is what one use in, in real world application. Yes, this is, this is definitely a standard security setting. This is the type of um, use pattern that we recommend people uh, um, uh, con uh, basically conform to palisade being um, a very flexible system can be set up to do rather arbitrary sets of parameters um, and of course then um, you are outside of the guidelines of 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 the um of the consortium um, and so there's there's no guarantee as to what your what your uh, security would be if you arbitrarily picked different values for for, the, for things like ring size and modulus size and and uh, um, hardness. So this is a set of parameters that have been uh, um, converged on and adopted by by the, um, uh, the homomorphic crypto uh, standards group. Okay, and this is a very um, this is a very secure set. 
Okay, does that answer the question? I hope uh, so. I believe so, yes. I'm just typing up the response um, with a link to the uh, consortium. Great. Thank you, Dave. And as I said, you can just look at the code and uh, thank you. I should have probably uh, pointed out what the, what the parameters were. Um, so we've run the code. And what I want to do finally is in a wrap up, I want to talk about how you can explore further. Um, there is a complicated example of three heavyweight processes that are participating in proxy key re-encryption. This is in the Palisade repository, Palisade development repository in the uh, PKE examples and the directory PRE server, okay? And this uses um, simple file-based synchronization uh, for, for very, for just for, for being ultra portable. Um, we intend to adapt this to uh, a more um, boost-oriented mutex and socket-based interaction. And when we do that, we're going to put that in the serial repository the serial examples repository, because we are currently working on several applications like this for some of the research work that we're doing. Um, this is a situation, I didn't go to a full cartoon because it's a little complicated, but I'll just describe the steps. Uh, this is a situation, this is a trusted proxy re-encryption server, okay? So this is a server that exists as a service in some imaginary environment. We have Alice and Bob are two, are two uh, clients, okay? What's the goal of proxy encryption? Well, Alice is generating some form of data, a data stream or a series of files. Alice has a, a private key and a public key, or I should say a secret key and a public key. The thing is, um, Alice doesn't wanna be there to have to hand keys off to other people. So what Alice does is uh, gives her secret key to, the server. Now, the server will build the crypto context that everybody will use. So one thing the server does is build the initial crypto context and then provides it to the clients as needed. OK, so Alice says, I'm going to register my decry decryption key to the server. So this is this is a secure transfer going to a server. The server has to be trusted, right, because this the server has the secret keys. But what we don't want to do is pass the secret key to everybody in the world who wants to use, who wants to see this data, right? So, so that's where the re-encryption comes in. So Bob comes in and says, "Well, I want to I want to read Alice's uh, data." So he sends his public key to the server. Now the public key takes Alice's secret key and Bob's public key, combines them into a recryption key, and the recryption key is passed on to Bob. Okay. So Bob doesn't get Alice's secret key. Bob has a recryption key, okay? Now what happens is Alice can, can send her encrypted data directly to Bob, who can decrypt it with a combination of the re-encryption key and his decryption key. Now, this example has Alice sending the data directly, but the data could have been in a repository. It can be somewhere where Alice is no longer in the picture. But um, the, the key thing is here is that Bob can read this data and only Bob with this recryption key and with his private key, okay? He doesn't need Alice's key. So, so this is a way of segregating um, data to data access to um, people who are, you know, basically who pass some tests to be allowed to use it, right? And for, for right now, Bob and Alice and, and the server just basically, you know, uh, as it's, it's not an example that you would implement. What you would have is some kind of uh, actual signature or protocol, uh, some kind of attribution uh, in a real world system. But the key thing here is to show multiple parties interacting with each other using serialization. And it's an example that you can look at and, and, and kick the tires on. So um, this example and other ones will be added to the serial examples repository over the next few months. Um, and um, it will be a, a good way for you to actually um, look at some simple interactions and the goal being that as people start using these, they will develop uh, secure protocols that you know can take advantage of these kinds of um, um, uh, tools, basically. And with that, uh, well, we have a very strange thing. It says thank you. 
for your attending and uh, do you have any questions? So uh, thank you, Dave. I, uh, uh, so this is Yuri. I just wanted to add a remark uh, uh, related to the previous question. I did actually look at the settings uh, that are used um, in the repo. And uh, it is correct that uh, uh, I mean the depth that was used for this example was relatively high. So the depth that basically was used is 10. So in other words, it's a, for a powerful. Uh, so although uh, we showcase uh, something like multiplication and rotations, but the idea is to show uh, uh, the serial is the size of uh, keys for some uh, deeper computation, something that mm -hmm. is uh, non-trivial. So it is, so the depth was sent to 10 and the security level was uh, set to 128 bits. And this is why the keys are relatively large. So this, these keys are on the larger size, uh, I mean, on the larger side of what you typically see with uh, homomorphic encryption. Mm -hmm. I'm typing this up right now also for the uh, Q and A session. Yes. So, so it's an interesting question. Um, Yuri, can you give people uh, a feeling for what are typical multiple multiplication depths for typical applications? You know, that is the number, multiplicative depth is the number of multiplies one can do in a chain from sort of beginning to end in, in a computation. So this means multipl you know, multiplicative depth of 10 would be 10 multiplies. How does rotation affect that? And um, you know, what's the largest one can can set a multiplicative depth to in CKKS before things start getting to be kind of difficult to use? <laughs> sure. Uh, thank you, Dave, for the question. Uh, so uh, regarding the depth, so uh, there are some uh, applications that just require a depth of one. Uh, for example, linear uh, regression inference, just an inner product, that's a very simple application and you can do something that's meaningful in this case. Uh, <laughs> then uh, there are quite often applications that require uh, larger depths and, and maybe just in the context of CKKS, I would, I would consider polynomial approximation as a good example. And uh, so, when we talk about the depth uh, in the case of polynomial approximation, let's say, uh, we are not talking about the degree of the polynomial or the number of actual multiplies, uh, but uh, the actual depth of the computation when we represent uh, uh, the computation using so-called binary tree approach. So in the case, let's say, if we did uh, uh, to compute uh, uh, a polynomial of degree 100, uh, we're talking about something like a log of, uh, base two of 100, I mean, roughly close to basically seven. Depth seven is something that would give us uh, uh, ability to compute uh, uh, a non-trivial polynomial. So in other words, even with a depth of 10, uh, some relatively uh, powerful computations uh, such as uh, polynomial approximations of high degree can be performed. Um, as far as the larger degrees in, uh, in, the, uh, in the level setting, uh, uh, we've, we've basically had some, uh, I mean, we wrote some applications and uh, with real reasonably good running times that uh, work with the depth 20, for example. Um, and uh, I've seen some applications, some users uh, uh, implementing uh, uh, solutions that went up to 40, uh, depth 40 or 50, and, and uh, those still worked. Uh, I would say after you uh, go beyond uh, 50 or so, uh, uh, using the you know, just pure leveled approach has limitations. And, and in that case, uh, techniques such as CDKS bootstrapping should be considered. Uh, but that, that, that's, what, that's what I would uh, consider as a, a kind of reasonable limit. So, so probably in the range from 20, starting with 20, this is where uh, uh, with uh, the pure level the approach may become uh, less beneficial and probably around 50 it's basically it's already uh, I mean of course it's, it's application dependent and what type of computations are performed at each uh, level but uh, that's I would, that's a higher level guideline basically there. That's great. Another question that I get that's related to this is uh, are rotations uh, also using any multiplicative depth? Automorphism, trans, uh, eval automorphism. Yeah, so this is a, a, a good question. So conceptually, uh, 
a rotation key is the same has the same format as the multiplication key so you can think of so in the example that uh, uh, Dave discussed uh, the four rotation keys are needed, therefore indices that are supported. So effectively the size that we need for rotation keys is 4x of what we need for a single multiplication key. Uh, so typically it's, yeah, that's that's the simplest way to think about it. Of course, uh, in some highly optimized scenarios, one could use, for example, compressed keys, the keys that uh, have a uh, smaller size if you need them only in the middle of the computation, but not at the beginning, but uh, this uh, it becomes very hard to support. So it's, uh, uh, it's by default in, in Palisade, we assume that uh, the uh, initial size of the keys is used. So, so the best thing to, in other words, uh, the, the best way to, to think about it is uh, to, uh, uh, treat one automorphism, one, one rotation key, to have the same size as the multiplication. Does it also util, does it also consume one of the depths of a uh, available? In, in other words, if I had uh, a depth 10, does doing a rotation on the, uh, on the ciphertext reduce it down to now depth nine, or is it? No, no, it's uh, the, the typical setup. It's rotations and additions are uh, some, these are operations that, uh, require much smaller noise or uh, than, uh, for example, multiplications. And that's uh, uh, that's the guideline we're following with all the implementations of the schemes. Uh, uh, and we use key switching techniques that guarantee that. So it's it's really the multiplicative depth that uh, determines uh, the uh, parameters in it. Okay, do we have any more questions? Yes, there is another question. Um, in the first example, quiet, qu client query is encrypted by the server, and then the client performs computation on encrypted parameters, I assume computation using encrypted parameters shared by the server. Um, how will this provide an anonymity to uh, user search? So generally the parameters are things that are agreed on ahead of time. And so uh, it, you know, basically standards and concrete standards that, that one uses. Um, and like any kind of standards, such as like AES um, um, key size and things like that, are, are things that are generally agreed upon ahead of time. Um, is my quick response to it. Um, Dave, do you have anything that you want to add to that? Yes, specifically in that example, right, the server generates a key pair, a secret and public key pair. The server does not share the secret key the server only provides the public key okay and so maybe yuri can talk a little bit more about public private key pairs and how that works in in uh, homomorphic encryption um it would be a bad thing to have the server generate the, the the both keys and give them both away okay that 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 is not what you do so in general one encrypts with one key and decrypts with the other key Right. And so um, if you do not have the so so, you know, we say public and private, we say secret sometimes. And really, it's, you know, one, you know, and, and, I, and I really call upon kind of Yuri to, to clarify this a bit. Um, one key is for encryption and one key is for decryption. OK, so that is why the answer gets sent back to the server for decryption, because the client is not able to decrypt. Uh, thank you, Dave. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll give a more general clarification uh, because what type of uh, form of encryption one uses depends on the use, I mean, on the actual use case, what on the scenario. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are three different scenarios that are supported by uh, Palisade. And the first, the uh, essentially simple scenario is uh, based on secret uh, key encryption, where the secret key is used to encrypt the data and the secret key is used to decrypt the result. So this is a classical two-party scenario of FHE, where uh, the party that encrypts the data will get the result after someone applies a model. For example, that second party has uh, a, a certain model that typically in the clear, I mean, for that party, and uh, they uh, execute the model and then uh, the uh, this party that in initially encrypted the data can decrypt the result. So this is the classical use case of uh, single key FHE with secret key encryption. Then in some scenarios, uh, 
the, uh, it makes sense to use public encryption. Uh, and uh, in the, the idea there is that uh, the, uh, the party that will be looking at the results of uh, uh, the uh, computation is different from the party that did the encryption. So, I mean, it's in certain cases that may make sense. I mean, it, it's and uh, uh, and, and uh, so that's that's a scenario of public encryption. Uh, and uh, then there uh, is a further extension that is also uh, supported in Palisade uh, based on threshold FHE, where uh, it, it essentially it's a, it's a generalization of public key encryption with additional security, with additional level of security, where each uh, 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 party that, so there are multiple parties, let's say multiple data owners contributing data, each of them uses so-called uh, secret share, has a secret share, then there is a protocol for them to combine their secret shares in a homomorphic way, in a secure way to get a joint public key. And that then that public key is used to encrypt the data, perform any computations, and at the end, the special distributed decryption process is used to decrypt. And this is something we uh, discussed in detail in the previous uh, webinar. So these are the three different models and which one makes sense in, you know, for a particular scenario. I mean, it depends on the scenario. So I, I would uh, consider uh, the, uh, the code example that um, Dave wrote as uh, an example of serialization. How do you do serialization uh, using servers, clients, and, and using basically a certain uh, circuit protocol, uh, rather than uh, as the recommended way <laughs> to use <laughs> FHE, because the recommended way really depends on the scenario that is basically for that application. So that that's the way I, I would look at uh, at Dave's uh, uh, example. Yeah, as I as I said, these are these are kind of fundamental building blocks in the. The, they enable you to assemble and put together protocols um, that that uh, would ensure security at a higher level. Okay. So, if there are no more questions, I think uh, I will pass it back to Kurt. All right. Well, Dave, thank you again for a um, you know the effort that you put into giving this talk, and thank you for uh, sharing the insights that you did. Um, a lot of good questions that came in. Um, please feel free to, uh, for the audience, the attendees, please feel free to reach out to any of us as we go forward uh, to the Palisade community. If you're interested in, in everything that we had and, and Dave had put a lot of uh, source code up in the repo for people to use for examples. Um, we will be um, having our next uh, episode of the Palisade webinar in the new year. Um, and uh, look forward to uh, reconvening then. And uh, well, thanks again, everyone, and have a great day and a great rest of the month. Thanks again, Dave.